Okay. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for everybody, God, that's receiving this message, God. I just pray that um, you open the heart, open the mind, God, to receive your message, God, and not only to um, hear your message, God, but to walk in it and uh, exercise it daily, God. Amen. All right. This is going to be Lesson 5. The title is going to be A Joyful Christian. What page? Oh, um, 29. Page 29. Cindy, can you give people books? Yeah. So the first title is Nature of the Joy of the World. Everyone wants to be happy. This is certainly one of the chief goals of people everywhere. Is there enjoyment in the world according to Ecclesiastes 11.9, which reads, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes, but no doubt that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. So yes, there's uh, enjoyment, or enjoyment in the world. According to this verse, what does the average person do in order to secure enjoyment? Which is to, um, you know, um, you know, walk in the ways of their heart. What is the end result of doing these things, which is God will bring it into judgment? What, what is the nature of the joy of the unsaved person, according to Job 25, which reads that the triumph of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment. Sin is deceiving in that while it is always offering happiness, it, is, it always leads to unhappiness and final misery. Relationship of joy to fellowship with God. In Revelation 4.11, we read in the King James Version that the man was created for God's pleasure. Likewise, man who in his original state was pure and holy had the privilege of enjoying fellowship with God. However, this fellowship and this joy was disrupted when men sinned. When men sinned. And because of this sin, he was separated from God. He might look for pleasure in his simple state, but the joy that he receives cannot compare to the joy that he received when he was in fellowship with God. But God, because of his infinite love for us, provided a plan of salvation whereby it would be possible for us to again have fellowship with him. This was made possible by the coming of Christ into the world. And by his death, burial, and resurrection, Christ became our sin barrier. And by receiving Christ Jesus as our personal Savior, our sins are forgiven. Yeah. Romans 4 5 tells us that our faith is counted for righteousness. Since our sins are what separates us from, from God, Isaiah 59 2, now that our sins are forgiven, we can do, we can. And do enjoy fellowship with God. First time on the earth. What does this fellowship with God produce according to Psalm 16 11, which reads, Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So it uh, produces pleasures forevermore. Fullness of joy. So, you have fullness of joy and uh, to be exposed to the path of life. Those of you who have tasted and seen the Lord is good, Psalms 38 or 34 8, know something of this joy that we have in Christ. How did Peter describe his joy in 1 Peter 1 8? Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom thou now ye see him not. Yet believing, you rejoice with joy, unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. What commandment is given to the Christian in Philippians 4.4? 4? Rejoice in the Lord always, and, and again I say rejoice. Only the Christian has lasting joy. His joy is not 
only in this world, but will continue in the world to come. 1 Peter 4, 13, Jude 24, Revelation 21, 4. In John 15, 11, Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. What two things included in these things? Verses 7 and 10. Um, 7, um, to sum it up, is your request from God shall be answered. And then uh, verse 10, abide in God's love. When we, abide, when we abide in the Lord and his commandments, then there is nothing to interrupt our fellowship with him, and our joy will be full. What happened to David's joy in Psalm 51, 12? Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Uh, it waned. Huh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, he lost it. Um, how did David lose his joy? Psalms 51, 4. Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou might be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. So he sinned against God, is uh, originally how he lost his joy. What did David do in verses 2, 3, 9, and 10? Um, to sum those verses up, uh, he repented constantly. He asked for, for forgiveness and to be cleansed spiritually. Amen. So we see that the joy of the believer is dependent on his walk with him. We can never lose our salvation, but we can lose our joy. If we sin, the Lord is displeased and our fellowship with him is temporarily broken and our joy disappears. If we want the Lord to restore the joy of our salvation, then we must do as David did. We must acknowledge our sin before the Lord and ask his forgiveness. Then our fellowship and our joy is restored. <clears throat> consider, the rel um, me. consider the relationship between a father and his son. The father and the son are having a good time together, playing together and enjoying each other's company. Then the course of events, something happened. Perhaps the boy lied to his father. Or it could, could have been any other wrongdoing. The boy realizes that he has done wrong and suddenly he doesn't feel like playing or talking with his father anymore. The father looks at his boy and realizes that something is wrong, but doesn't say anything. Finally, the boy can take it no longer. He runs to his father, confesses the whole thing, and asks his father, asks for his father's um, forgiveness. His father freely forgives and throws his arms around him. The boy is happy again because his fellowship with his father has been restored. This is similar to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Note in the story above that the boy was still his father's son even when he was disobedient. Likewise, when we sin, we do not lose our standing with God. We are still God's child, but we do lose our joy. Victory over sin. Joy then is a result of life, of fellowship with the Lord. A Christian walking with the Lord is a happy Christian. But as we sing, sin interrupts this fellowship we have with the Lord. How do we obtain victory over sin? It is important to realize that we cannot do this in our own strength. Romans 7, 18 through 19 shows us that the result of trying to do this in our own strength. We can only live a life of victory by letting the Holy Spirit do it for us. Mm. At any given time, we are either being motivated and led by the Holy Spirit or we, be, or we are being led by the sin nature with which we were born. Amen. Our, our identification with Christ. A wonderful truth is the fact that the believer is identified with Christ. What does 1 John 5 20 have to say about our concerning our relationship with Christ? Which is, um, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may 
know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. The expression in Christ signif uh, signifies, signifies a union between the believer and Christ. What further truth concerning our relationship with Christ is given? Colossians 3.3 uh, 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ. For which things say, for, for which things say, the wrath of God coming on the children of disobedience. In God, in God, shows Christ's own union with God. And emphasizes our union with God in Him. This is a good place to be in. Chapter says, To be in Christ is to be in the sphere of His own infinite person, power, and glory. He surrounds, He protects, He separates from all else, and He indwells the one in Him. He also supplies in Himself all that a soul will ever need in time or eternity. In Christ, and its equivalents occur 130 times in the New Testament. This union with Christ took place when we were baptized with the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ at the time of our conversion. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. At that time, we became identified with Christ and his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and glorification. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. The word am is really in the past tense and should read have been. It is so stated in most other versions. What does it mean to be crucified with Christ? Um, my definition here is uh, not to live for our flesh, but to live for God and um, make our base of existence for Christ. So, in essentially putting off the old nature. Amen. It means that I was so identified with Christ that when Jesus Christ died, I died also. This may be difficult for us to understand, but this is the way God looks at it. He considers us to be in Christ when Christ died. We are also identified with Christ in his resurrection. How is this expressed in Colossians 3.1? If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. We are identified with Christ in his present position in the heavenly places. How is this truth given in Ephesians 2 6? And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He is in heaven, and we are on earth. Yet our union with him is such that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1.3 Now it does all this help us in achieving victory over sin? Let us look at Romans 6.6 6, where we read, We know that our old, unrenewed self was nailed to the cross with him in order that our body, which is the instrument of sin, might be made ineffective and inactive or evil, that we might no longer be slaves of sin. This verse reaffirms that we are identified with Christ and his death. This is a fact of divine revelation that we are called upon to believe. The body here is referring to the physical body as possessed by the simple nature in the sense that the latter is controlling the body. The fact that our old unrenewed self was nailed to the cross with him means that it is possible for the old nature to be rendered ineffective because we are no longer slaves. Verse 7 goes on to say, for when a man dies, he is free, loose, delivered from
from the power of sin among them. This death is referring to the separation of the believer from the power of the sinful nature. Although it is true that this old sinful nature is in the believer until he dies, 1 John 1, 8, he no longer is obligated to follow the old nature. He is no longer under its grip. What does Romans 6, 11 tell us to do? Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus our Lord. As a watchman, Nee said, we know that our old man has been crucified with Christ. The next step is to reckon it so. The word reckon means to count a thing to be true. We should consider ourselves to be dead to sin's authority and, res and resurrected to the newness of life under the control of the Holy Spirit. The application of these truths to our lives will help us to minimize the conflict, the two natures within us, and help us to obtain deliverance from sin. The victory is never completed, or is never complete in this life. However, for just when we think we have obtained a great victory, Satan will be there to make us fall. What does 1 Corinthians 10, 12 say in this regard? Wherefore, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. The truths given in this section are no longer the milk, but the meat of the word. If at this point you, know, you do not understand, do not be discouraged. The more you read and digest the Bible, the more the Holy Spirit will enable you to understand. Causes and results of a Christian. Okay. So I want to touch on that really, really quick, a little bit deeper. Um, because I think some of us, every one of us here, you, you have this new nature that God has given us. We, we reckon the old nature dead by the power and authority of Jesus Christ who nailed sin to the cross. We do have now authority through the Holy Spirit that he's poured down to have victory over the sin nature within us. However, Paul has said, uh, I don't do the things I want to do. I do the things I don't do. Nevertheless, not I, but sin that dwells within me. So what does that mean? It means even Paul, the greatest evangelist, had sin nature that was worn out. What does that What does that mean? You no longer are a slave to it. It doesn't own you. You have authority over it. But here's the, na here's the nature of sin. You willingly choose it. You willingly choose it. You're saying, I transgress. Sin, is, sin can be missing the mark. Transgression means I know what's right, but I choose sin nevertheless. So what do we have to do? Crucify our thoughts, bring our thoughts into captivity through the power of the Holy Spirit, and let the Holy Spirit have power over it. Amen? You are willingly choosing it now that you're saved. If you're saved and you're in the Spirit of God, we, we select it. And so you can then become entangled under it again, where you can quickly repent and the Lord will give you victory. But that's, that's the, it's, I know it sounds confusing, but now that you're saved, you have authority over sin. So you, you willingly choose it. Let's not do that. Amen? Amen. Causes and results of a Christian's joy. Joy in our lives is one of the best selling points we have in the making in making contact with other people. Whether it is for the purpose of witnessing for the Lord or just for the purpose of getting along well with others. A happy, joyful spirit does more to create an attractive impression than anything else. Amen. Now, what are some things that contribute to the increase, to and increase our joy in the Lord? What is one thing that will add to our joy, according to Jeremiah 15, 16, which is, sorry, but I have it written down here to sum it up. Um, being called by God, receiving the word. Meditate, meditating upon God's word is a wonderful way to have fellowship with the Lord. And doing so is a great joy. Also, we have seen as we spend time in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. Psalm 16, 11. In 2 Corinthians 3, 7, 
in verse 13, we read that Moses, after being alone with God, when God gave him the Ten Commandments, found it necessary to cover his face with a veil because of the glory which shone on his face. Verse 18 in Philip's New Testament says, But all of us who are Christians have no veils on our faces, but reflect like mirrors the glory of the Lord. We are transfigured by the Spirit of the Lord and other increasing splendor into his own image. May each of us experience the reality of this verse. If we are going to reflect like mirrors the glory of the Lord, we have to spend time in the presence of the Lord. If our churches were filled with this type of Christian, we would have revival in our churches and we would attract the world. Yes. People of the world get a stimulus from drinking that temporarily lifts their spirits. But we are admonished in Ephesians 5, 18 through 19. Don't get your stimulus from wine, yeah. for there is always the danger of excessive drinking. But let the spirit stimulate your soul. Yes. Express your joy and singing among yourselves. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making music in your heart for the ears of God. The joy and happiness we have in the presence of the Lord beats anything the world has to offer. Amen. Of what further benefit is the joy of the Lord? Nehemiah 8.10 For your joy, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Yes. The joy of the Lord gives us strength to do all of our tasks better. Yeah. It is, is it, is it possible for a Christian to have joy in adverse circumstances? Amen. First Peter 1, 6, 4, 12, and uh, James 1, 2. And I'll just be reading uh, First Peter 1, 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a reason, if need be, cease. Oh, yeah. Now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. It is, in, uh, to answer it, is, uh, yes. Um, it is possible to be sorrowful and rejoicing at the same time. Yes. Second Corinthians 2, all right, yeah, Second, second Corinthians 6.10, which reads, um, As, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. Amen. As having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Amen. There are many things which can cause a Christian to sorrow. Adverse circumstances, departure of a loved one, unsaved loved ones and friends, sin about us. But through, but through it all, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Deuteronomy um, 33, 27. What is another source, another source of rejoicing? According to Psalms 126, 5, 6. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with them. Yes. If, if we are faithful to witness to others about what Christ means to us, we will undoubtedly be used of the Lord to win souls for him. And, and this will be a source of great joy to us. What did Paul say with regard to souls which he had helped win for the Lord? 1 Thessalonians 2.19 Which reads on um,
All right, First Thessalonians 2.19 reads, uh, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? What is one difference between believers and unbelievers given in 1 Thessalonians 4.13? But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So the difference between believers and unbelievers in this passage is uh, the unbelievers are sorrowful and without hope. Amen. Believers have hope. Yep, and the believers have hope and joy. Assurance. Why do believers not have to sorrow? Verses 14 and 17. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with, bring, bring with them. Verse 17 says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. The second coming of Christ is the blessed hope of the Christian. Titus 2.13 What will Christ do with our body, with our bodies? Philippians 3.21 Who shall change our vow body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And that was the last question, and um, I just close out with prayer. I thank you, dear Heavenly Father, God, for allowing us, God, to have your word, God, to have the privilege, God, and the blessing of having your word, God. I just pray that you bring us not to uh, take it for granted, God, not to become in place in God, but to uh, understand, God, um, the treasure we have before us, God. And I pray that, again, God, that you bring us to walk in it, live it, God, and that your will come from it. In Jesus' name.